Hey there, welcome to my channel. If you're new, I'm Christy. And if you're returning, it's really great to see you. For those of you that don't know, I am growing cut flowers and I have a homestead garden where I do put up the majority of our groceries for the year and um, kind of live that lifestyle. So I share a lot of different things on here. I'm in Northern Alberta, Canada, growing zone 2B. It's a little challenging in, in our climate um, for what I'm doing, but I do like to share little bits of information that I find helpful. And so today's vlog is a little bit about that. Some of the things that I've learned in my climate um, that have been really beneficial for me in having success as a homesteader and also as a grower, a commercial grower for cut flower production. So I hope you enjoy today's vlog and we will see you here in a bit. This is a flower farm, not a bird bath. Go away. Naughty birds. This week we had our very first anemone bloom and I accidentally broke its cute little head off. Luckily there is plenty more where that came from. Very excited for this. I think one of the most exciting thing about spring is that how excited the animals are and how they just want to be everywhere and into everything. And it's been a really long hard winter on our chickens. We've, they've been laying their little hearts out. We've been collecting eggs and um, they're just really enjoying getting out and about and running around the yard. They're keeping the bugs in check. Um, we definitely, I did fill the incubator with some dual purpose birds. We're gonna have some layers, like replacement layers, um, since we have some that are aging out. And I also have meat birds on the go. So the roos will be meat birds and the hens or the pullets will be replacement birds. So the incubator's full and I'm really excited. So you'll have to watch because I'm sure there'll be some baby chicks in the near future on the next vlog or two. Um, so that's very, very exciting here as well. Yes, we still have some snow and we are down quite a few guineas actually we had some predators um but it's all good now really so graceful really So this week I've been doing a lot of potting and I've been mixing some potting soil with worm castings and bone meal and just potting my perennial bare roots into little four inch pots or bigger. And this is a great hack that I like to do that saves a lot of time when you get bare roots in bulk or your storage bulbs. Um, use one of those little watering crates for your seedlings and dump them in there and look at that easy peasy it's like a strainer for dirt i did notice i had an audience some very nosy neighbors these are some domestic bison they are friendly and curious and they just want to be up in my business all the time
home a little bit more, so it's been nice because I've been working in the shop doing some potting, just because I have a lot of the perennials that I picked up from Van Noort um, in Edmonton a few weeks ago, or a week ago, I can't even remember. <laughs> the, a vlog or two ago, I picked them up. I've been potting some of them up and I planted a bunch of the lilies. And so it's been nice to be able to work in the shop and have him in there a little bit. He's been working on his truck. So it's it's been it's been kind of nice, but um, you know, something I'm not used to doing either. So we're making things work. We're making the farm work, we're making work, 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 and we're making uh, sports work for Chaz. And it's totally new this year. We're just totally, it's different. I am a little concerned about my homestead garden. I don't have near as much going on and I do have a fungus gnat problem in my grow room, which is actually preventing me from starting my seeds for my warm season crops and my veggies. So I'm kind of on the fence of what I'm gonna do to remedy that, whether I'm gonna start seeds in a different building altogether, like the shop, um, and put a lot more heat mats in there and kind of contain it, um, or, what I'm going to do if I'm going to just try to, I'm, I'm, I'm up in the air with that. So I am way behind on my seed starting, but I'm starting to pull ahead a little bit on my planting. So it is what it is. So, you know, we planted uh, 1,400 seed, well, just about 1,500 seedlings total in the last couple days, seedlings or start like uh, pre-sprouts. And so I'm really, really looking forward to having that, or I'm really glad I have that checked off the list because that was such a big, it was a big commitment to take the time to do that. And I'm glad it's done. And the weather held out and it looks like the weather's going to hold out for them to get a few more days to, to sprout in to the ground before um, we get some cold snaps or some bad weather, which that's what I wanted. I wanted it to root into the ground and then be hit with a little bit of bad weather. So they think they're going through a winter. So it's working. The craziness and the madness is working in my favor, so. One of the projects today is to get these back in service. So these were originally inside of the cold frame and I needed to change things up. So I learned something growing food and uh, veg vegetables and cut flowers up here in our Northern climate. Um, I can get away with putting things that are a little bit more sensitive, frost sensitive, out when I line the inside of raised beds with plastic if I'm not planting right in the ground. So I was thinking about actually planting this up one side of it with calla lilies and that's why I went ahead and I wanted to make sure that this was really good and had a good barrier of plastic around it. Um, also because I didn't stain the inside of the wood and I don't have time to do that. I want to protect it a little bit more from the elements just from it being saturated with in the soil and i also found it helps to create um put like wood down in the bottom of the bed so you don't have to use so much dirt but also it helps create um, more heat um, one the decomposing and the composting of the wood does create heat and also it creates air pockets which are insulators so um, that's one of the things that I learned growing in the north that can help you um, kind of push the boundaries in raised bed gardening when you're growing things that are a little bit more cool um, sensitive and not as frost tender or cold hardy as what our zone is in 2B here. planted a ton of stuff. I moved my ranunculus out and I really like 
pre-sprouting my ranunculus, but I also like tricking it into thinking that it's been fall planted. That has been very, very beneficial for me in my season. And you know, because I have such a short season, it's a three month season. Our season is very comparable to Alaska. Um, I think that we probably um, have a little bit more challenges than a lot of people do because of our cold temperatures, but we do make up for it because we have very long sunny days. And so, you know, here where we are, we do have a lot of pros and cons that come with the cold, but we do have basically a 90 to 100 day grow season. So um, I do find that cut flowers that take 90 days to bloom, you, you know, pre-sprouting them and making them think that they have been put into a false winter or fall planted has been very, very beneficial for what I'm doing as a, a commercial grower. And so here is my favorite way to plant ranunculus by far. I planted this this way in January, which I'm starting to see buds pushing up in my greenhouse already. So we'll have a target of Mother's Day for a ranunculus. And um, so I'm doing the same method outside under, under row cover because um, we're definitely gonna dip down. It could even get to 20 below again. We've had that happen before in the past. So I'm anticipating a fake winter yet. So this is my, but this is my favorite method of planting ranunculus um, as pre-sprouts instead of having all the greens up top. major dilemma this week the furnace stopped working in the greenhouse and it got really really cold in there thankfully Tyson was home and he was able to fix it it was just the thermostat this is a palomino cup mushroom which means that there is some natural soil health going on in my soil and the choice that I made to go to be more regenerative egg with my flower farm operation is actually working and this is a good sign. That means that the soil is turning a new leaf and it's no longer toxic and contaminated. It is beginning to be more full of life. The microbiome in the soil is thriving and that's what I want to see. I am finding it very, very challenging with my seed starting schedule and sports. So some of you that are new, you don't know, but um, my son made a double A team uh, playing baseball, which is a three hour drive one way for me to take him to ball practice. So I'm spending six hours, two to three times a week just driving and then the practice is two hours. So I'm spending like a full eight hour shift <laughs> away from the farm which is not something I'm used to doing. I'm used to being at home, working at home, homesteading, doing everything at home, from home, not going anywhere, and now my life is just on the road. Um, I'm finding it to be very, very challenging. I'm finding my sleep is disrupted, and I'm finding I'm getting very behind, much behind on my schedule. But I am finding that I am getting better at scheduling stuff. So. It's kind of forcing me to be more responsible in some crazy ways. Like I don't just have all this time to just kind of manage. I have very specific amounts of time that I must manage. And, and it's just, it's, it's like micromanaging and I'm not used to that. So um, it's very much a learning experience for me to be on the road and you know not being able to be here doing all the extra things, starting the seeds on this day, you know, having all that disposable time where you can shuffle, shuffle things around during the day. Um, it's been, it's been interesting. And so, you know, um, 
we've had some fun road trips so far and I'm looking forward to a lot of really great ball games and Chaz is really enjoying it and um, you know, he's 14. It won't be many years, he'll be driving himself to ball and so I'm not complaining. We have the very first daffodils on the farm in the greenhouse and I'm so excited. So we're actually gonna go do that right now. We're gonna go pull our first harvest and put them in the fridge. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna hydrate them and I'm really excited. And I might have a tulip or two I get to pull today. So let's go check that out. The tulips aren't ready. The stalk is too short. But look, there's anemones. So this is why I, I'm trying to fake out a winter planting. These were last year's, this is this year's. You see the difference? Fall planted, spring planted, big time difference. And I'm really on target and happy that I'm on target for Mother's Day mini sunflowers. I cannot wait. And of course, the Clarkia decided it wants to start blooming. So I need to stake it and pinch it. I'm hoping they will hold off blooming until Mother's Day. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed today's vlog and I hope to see you here again soon. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. Hey guys, so I wanted to jump on here and tell you about some perennials that actually do pretty well here. Um, they can be a little bit tricky to get started. So I wanted to give you some tips <laughs> of what I do on the farm, um, how to get these going well. So this here is what is called a perennial flux. I'm growing two varieties. I'm growing orchid yellow and orchid green. And this is what they look like um, when they come bare root. Because this is a perennial, I would think that I could just put it in the ground just like this and let it come up. Um, I could try that, but I probably, I'd probably fail miserably. Um, and that's why these are probably not common to see on the shelves at this time of the year, because if you just plop them in the ground, they're probably not gonna do very well. You need to give them a start indoors. So I need to pot these and grow them on. I thought I could just put them in the garden and in my field and be done with it, but boy was I wrong. So here I am um, potting up these little perennials. So don't do what I do. Um, do what I say instead. Um, they prefer the soil to be a little bit more moist, but they like to dry out, like not completely dry out or shrivel out, but they like the soil to kind of moisten and then um, dry and moisten and dry. Um, so someplace that isn't going to be really quickly draining um, or saturate them is a good spot. For These guys, they will go, so like this is the little root, like the rooting system. I will put these in one, this part one inch under soil level. 
So I don't know if you can see that. So about one inch under the soil level is where this will go. This is kind of already growth. Um, so I'm gonna put these in a pot and let them green up and establish themselves as a plant before I plant them out. But in, in the grow pot, I will put them about an inch under. Going from the root cluster part here, where like where it's all kind of growing from. Not this part, because this is a sprout, is trying to produce leaves, as you can tell. Um, so really important to know about that. Oh, these plants, they like they do like well-draining soil, but they also like a lot of moisture. And they like typically full sun, but they can tolerate a little bit of shade, especially here where we have long, long, long days. Um, they definitely are a great candidate for that. So, and they're kind of, I love phlox. They're so pretty as a landscaping flower, um, but also as a cut flower. And I'm really excited. I don't know how many stems we'll get off of these this year, but next year, watch out because oh, Rhonda's gonna make some nice stuff. Um, so there's that. The other one I wanted to talk, tell you about, this gnarly looking thing. Oh, it broke right there. But um, this is a sedum. This variety is a matrona, 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 I think it is called, variety of sedum. They like sandy soil. So if you have a river lot, these would probably do really well. Like if you're down at the flats um, or, you know, like Kalina's, these kind of things would do really well in sandy soil and they do like heat, they like dry. They thrive in like more of that kind of Kelowna weather kind of stuff, which can kind of happen down at the river where it's sandy, well-draining and hot. But also they like cool temperatures as well because they are cool flowers. They can thrive well there because it's hot and it's cool and it's well-draining. Um, so they, they kind of are an answer to a lot of things. The problem of it is, is these are kind of putting them in zone three or, or sorry, zone two is kind of pushing it. So if you're further north um, and you have like a river lot or something in the north, um, where it's like a zone one, it may not be one that will come back unless you heavily mulch it in the fall um, because those temperatures just get too low and it can't sustain that. So, you know, it's kind of one that is a little bit fussy, but it thrives on neglect. It just needs protection in the winter from the cold. So I usually mulch mine over with um, shavings or leaves and, um, they do fine. So I'm just adding to my collection of sedum this year. So this is what this is. They have to have full sun. They don't like shade. They hate shade. They love heat. They like the heat. They like the sunshine. So that's what that needs to be. So when you plant these, you want to look for the crown. So this here is the crown, right? And this is like a shoot coming up to grow. So what you do is you plant this right below the soil surface and you want to try to spread out the roots so that it's like going, like it, it goes in the directions all over the place um, under the surface. It likes to kind of dwell there. Um, and I always, whenever I'm planting any type of stuff like this, I always make sure to add bone meal. Sedum doesn't like a lot of fertilizer. So if you have a fertilizing routine and you fertilize your other plants, and then you fertilize your sedum and it doesn't look good, it's because you've probably, <laughs> you've probably loved it too much. It doesn't like love. It's a, it's a loveless plant. So if you don't have any love to give, this is the one for you. <laughs> I love them, but um, I, I love them just the right amount so they stemmy do okay for me. I need to actually bring some sand in. And when you plant these outside, <laughs> The best way to do this would be start them in a pot. So if I was to take these outside and plant them, they wouldn't like it because they like the temperatures at nighttime to be at least 13 degrees Celsius before they start establishing a root system. So I would need to put these into pots and that's what I'm going to be doing today is putting them in a pot and growing them on. It's even actually too cold at night in my big greenhouse for these guys to get them started. So I'll probably get them going um, I might even take them into my grow room just so they get a little bit more of a boost and start rooting in the, into, the, into the soil more so than pushing growth up top. Um, they can be fussy to get going. So they're a great plant. Um, they are fussy, but they are worth it and they are a pretty hardy perennial here if you can get them established in your garden. So 
Um, they grow, they're great cut flowers, especially for fall, and they dry really well as cut flowers as well. So, anyway, well, thanks for listening to me ramble. I'm gonna get to work because I got a lot of it to do. Bye.